Welcome to the second lecture of week two of this course, um, which finally turns to something more concrete. I promised that we would get there, and uh, we have reached that point, at least for the time being. In this lecture and in the following lecture, um, because we have two lectures on artifacts. And that is what your semester project is on, uh, to select an artifact and describe it and interpret it. And we will talk more about that as we go along. So these two lectures, focusing on artifacts as such, I hope will help with that. Now, if you've already selected or chosen an artifact that you want to use for your project, that's great. And I hope this lecture and the next lecture will help you evaluate uh, the suitability of what it is you've chosen um, and also give you some insight into how to approach it, how to think about it, what is, uh, is, what is the intent of the project, um, but I'll be speaking more about that as we go along too. Um, if you haven't selected one yet, um, I hope you are thinking about it uh, and I hope this lecture and the next lecture will help you think about it and come to a decision. The um, artifact that you choose needs to be approved by me by February 5th, which I believe is a week from Friday or next Friday, a week from next Friday, I think it is. Um, you know, we get confused because this lecture is actually ahead of schedule. So at the end of the second week, uh, this is actually the following Friday is when it's due. So it's February 5th. Um, now again, uh, as I think the rubric states on the assignment, this is not a graded assignment, it's a completion assignment. Um, not much is required, it's just to explain what you've chosen and why you've chosen it, um, and we'll go from there. So that's, this is nothing to sweat, it's just to make sure that we have a good uh, point of, of, of departure for your project. And the more you are aware of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with artifacts, uh, the better you'll be able to determine that. So we begin then with the question of what is an artifact to begin with? If we're focusing on artifacts uh, for this project and in this course, uh, what is it and what is it intended to be? Now in common parlance, I think artifact usually means something that is discovered, that is dug up. Um, and is distinguished from texts or documents or things like that, or monuments or whatever have you. And that could very well be, but I am using it in a very general sense, at least in terms of this course, to be anything that exists, or rather I should say, an artifact is anything that exists that has been made. A rock, as such, is not an artifact. But a rock placed in a monument, a rock used for building, can be and is. An artifact, again, is any thing. And a thing is one of those great words in English that means uh, almost anything we want it to mean. Um, but here it is an object. Now we can talk about artifacts as relics, remnants, ruins. Um, traces, any physical object that has been made, or any part of a physical object that has been made that still exists, qualifies for this course anyway as a, a, an artifact. We have ruins, uh, we have excavations that dig things up and find things, um, and all these things are artifacts. They're things that have been made. And what has been made by humans signify a lot, or can signify a lot, about the human culture and the human individuals that made them. And so artifacts is a very important part of doing history as part of our sources, because everything we look at is a thing. Even an idea does not exist unless it is contained in a thing, whether it is a manuscript, a published book, a pamphlet, um, an inscription, 
uh, and oh, we go, but we'll be talking more about that uh, both later in this lecture and then even more so uh, in the following lecture in terms of dealing with documents and texts as artifacts. So in, in that sense, it's the broadest definition possible. And I don't want you to get caught up on, you know, what is an artifact and what isn't. It's anything that exists, any object that is not simply a natural occurrence, anything that is made by humans and human culture. Now, the point in describing this and in describing an, art, an artifact is to distinguish very clearly between the description of a thing, of the artifact that you're looking at, and then its interpretation. So often these two aspects, description and interpretation, um, are fused together. Now, as I've discussed in the past two lectures, in any case, um, every description is itself an interpretation. If we say, uh, we have an object and we say that the, it is, the color is red. Someone else might look at it and say, well, it's not quite red. Uh, it's um, really more orange. When we say, okay, well, what type of red is it? How vibrant is it? What shade of red is it? And there could be discussions about that. And those are all interpretations of a basic aspect of describing a thing. Um, the size, now we can measure it. Let's say it is this whatever object we're talking about is um, five inches um, in width and um, six inches in length and two inches in depth. For, for simplicity's sake, just making it <laughs> a, a rectangular thing. Um, we can describe that and there would be less room for interpretation in terms of measurement, even though different people can measure it slightly different. Is it really uh, five inches or is it five inches and, you know, uh, a, a, a sixteenth of an inch? You know, is it five inches and one sixteenth of an inch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those, so those things can be debatable, but they're more um, clear and again, less room for, for interpretation. But when we start to say, now, what is this object? What is this thing, this artifact? Then it becomes even more open to interpretation. <clears throat> now, some things are quote unquote clear, a book. This is a book, okay, fine, it's a book. Um, most people would be able to agree on that, but then there would be issues of, well, what constitutes a book? Is it a book, is it a pamphlet? How do we deal with those issues and those determinations, those labels, as I discussed in the previous lecture, are all interpretations of the thing. And that is just <clears throat> to get at the, the description of whatever object you're talking about. Is it round? Well, what do you mean by round? Do you mean a perfect sphere, which really doesn't necessarily exist? Do you mean it's more round than it is square? Do you mean it is not rectangular or uh, like a pyramid, diamond shape? Uh, those are open to interpretations. But the thing is, with artifacts and things, we can actually analyze them and discuss them and put them on the table and dissect them. Hopefully we won't be cutting up artifacts. But the point is that it, there is something physical that it's there, which is very more concrete than an idea or a movement or something else along those lines. And as I've already discussed, and we'll be discussing again and again and again, Every source we have from the past that allows us to say anything at all about the past exists as an, ob an object, an artifact, a physical thing. Ideas in our heads we can't get to unless they are translated into a thing that someone else can look at and read. You can't read my mind. I can't read your mind. Um, that's probably a, a huge boon for both of us in, in, those sense, in that sense. But the physical objects can be observed and analyzed. And that's the point of departure for his, dealing with historical sources, is the thing itself, the things that are our sources, and to enable us 
to squeeze out as much meaning and interpretation as we can, we need to have a very good description and understanding of what it is that we are talking about. Because only when we have that description can we then move to the next stage of what this thing signifies. You know, I talked about signification uh, in a previous lecture. We have the thing themselves, and then what do they signify? Because things in and of themselves don't have any meaning. We have to bring meaning to them. We have to discern the meaning that is there that we could only can do based on our analysis of the thing itself. Whether it is a word, a sentence, or an object. So in that sense, we begin with objects. And what objects are, how do we describe them, how do we then interpret them, and what do they signify. Now, moving on to the third slide here. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, okay, how do we find objects? Well, again, two major ways. One is through archaeology. Archaeology is a discipline in and of itself. Um, it is the uncovering, recovering, discovery of things. Whether it's Indiana Jones, assuming you all know Indiana Jones, or... Um, Medieval archaeologists who go and you know dig up castles or the ruins of castles or graveyards or bones, uh, the bones of Richard III, King of England, were recently discovered underneath a parking lot. You know some of these excavations are uh, only started because the these objects are found by chance, by you know developments by builders, and they come across their building and and digging out um, the basis for the foundation of their new building and they come across bones they come across ruins of some sort and then the archaeologists come in and start to excavate what is there and that is i think something that we are all aware of and uh, it's in popular culture we know it um, in terms of that uncovery but then once we have those artifacts recovered by means of archaeology then comes the process of what are these things? How do we describe them? If these are bones, we can measure them. We can do perhaps DNA analysis, obviously potentially carbon dating analysis, and then determining what kind of a bone is this. So we need to know anatomy in that sense uh, to know where the bone is. I think most of us would be able to tell the difference between a skull and a, a, a femur maybe. But how do you tell, is it a right femur or a left femur? Is this a phalange? Is it a toe? Is it a finger? Which finger is it? Which toe is it? Is this a rib? Is Where does it all fit? And so in order to do things like that, it is um, necessary to have a lot more knowledge and skill or to find people with knowledge and skill to help us even describe what it th this thing is. Um, if we come across a stone that, uh, that is obviously a ruin from something else, what kind of a stone is it? What um, might it been a part of? Did it contribute to a, a structure of a wall or a cathedral um, or a building, a civic building? Uh, what material is it? What kind of stone is it? Uh, and what does that tell us? Because is it uh, a stone that was quarried and, and shaped and formed uh, locally in the region more or less nearby where it was actually found? Or does it indicate that, my gosh, um, this came from a quarry you know, uh, 100 miles away or 200 miles away, 1,000 miles away? Uh, that, and that helps us understand trade patterns and everything else. Um, in ancient Mesopotamian, for example, um, one of the precious metals that was used for money, for decoration, for all kinds of things, was lapis lazuli, um, a beautiful blue mineral of some sort. I don't know that much about it. But the nearest source from Sumer, in the south of Mesopotamia, was like a thousand miles away. 
that are the nearest quarry. So somehow it, they were able to identify where to get this precious metal and then bring it back to them. And that tells us a lot about the sophistication of the culture at the time. Um, you know, the, the, the concepts of, of Stonehenge, which I'm sure you all know, Stonehenge, uh, still a, a mystery of where did these stones come from? Where were they quarried? How did they get there? as well as then what does it all mean and there's a wide variety of different interpretations about all those things so even when we're talking about ruins and archaeologically discovered recovered things artifacts the description and interpretation can be very close together and if we don't get the description correct we're not going to be able to get the interpretation correct or a reliable interpretation a reliable description and the description as i already said are things that are verifiable uh, other scholars can come and identify them and say okay that's not really what i see i see it as you know a burgundy rather than red i see it as you know five and one sixteenth inches rather than five those all things can be uh debated and analyzed based on the thing itself. <clears throat> and the same thing applies to texts, because texts exist in things, in books and manuscripts and parchment, pieces of paper, inscriptions on stones. And before we can talk about the text, the writing, what the writing signifies and means, we have to first analyze the object and thing itself. And again, that will be something I'll be talking a lot more about <clears throat> in the following lecture. But in addition to things that are discovered, that are dug up um, or found by means of archaeology, artifacts as things that exist that have been made are all around us. Everyday things that are made. Anything that is right before our eyes can be an artifact or is an artifact. It can serve as a source of Historical inquiry, and it all starts with inquiry, question, asking questions, wanting to know, and interpretation and analysis. So by certainly, I do not mean by your artifact project that you have to uh, come up with some ruin or relic from the past that has been discovered or that you have to go out and dig something up. You can just look around you, look in your you know, cupboard if you would like. And why do I say that? Because whatever thing there is can serve as an artifact if we know how to treat it and deal with it and discern the meaning therein. Now, this is all getting at something that's called material culture. And material culture is itself, uh, let's say, a subdiscipline of history, the study of material culture. <laughs> But it's also a foundational discipline of history. Because as I mentioned, every source that we have, every piece of evidence that we have that signifies the past in some fashion, though it does so in the present, obviously, as we've already discussed, <clears throat> is an object. And that's where we begin, and that's where we have to begin with all of our interpretations, analysis, investigations, whatever source we have, we have to begin with it as a physical object and therefore a material object. We don't have sources that are immaterial. Ideas are immaterial, but ideas are contained in material objects, material artifacts. Uh, and again, I'll be talking more about that next lecture. The material culture <clears throat> deals with the things and their meaning. And just as an example, uh, one of the members of our department, uh, Dr. Shrum, uh, wrote a wonderful book um, focusing on Mr. Coffee, that was at least one aspect of it, um, and dealing with material cultures from the, you know, early 20th century through mid 20th 20th century <clears throat> and um, just think about how many of you have a coffee maker well most of us probably if we drink coffee 
We make it in some fashion. And if you've heard of Mr. Coffee, you know that that was uh, an important coffee maker, developed I think in the 50s or 60s at some point when it first came out. And it was in a lot of people's homes. I had a Mr. Coffee way back when, but even all that long ago. Don't have it anymore, but that's a whole other issue. But her analysis of this, this mundane daily thing on our kitchen counter, revealed all sorts of dimensions of human culture, of U.S. culture, not you, well, humans, U.S., sorry. <laughs> we are humans, most of us in any case, but of American culture during the period. And why was that? One of the things she showed in this presentation, when she uh, gave a presentation to the department uh, on this, and it was absolutely fascinating, <clears throat> was with advertising. And before Mr. Coffee came along, serving coffee and percolators and the whole bit was always something that women did. They made the coffee and served it to the men folk, maybe with the women too. Always dressed nicely in those things. But who became the spokesperson for Mr. Coffee? Keep in mind, too, Mr. Coffee, not Mrs. Coffee, or Miss Coffee, or Ms. Coffee. Mr. Coffee? Joe DiMaggio. Now, if you don't know Joe DiMaggio, he was a great baseball player, became a, a, an icon of popular history and popular culture in the U.S., um, if you know Simon and Garfunkel, their song, um, what's, what is it? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? Our nation, you know, turns us lonely sights to you. Anyway, it's it's it, he was a big figure, uh, one of the first big sports stars, became um, widely known within American culture, and he became the spokesperson and advertiser for Mr. Coffee. So there was this studly baseball player making his own coffee so we're getting at gender roles we're getting at household understandings and how households are run and functioning we're looking at a transition from something as fundamental to a family to a couple to an individual as making coffee from being a female task to being a male task and how that all takes place is all part of the meaning of that physical object. Now that's just an example. It all is in, uh, based on what questions we ask. Um, how do we go about interpreting this? Because if we just say, oh, yeah, it's just a coffee machine, there's other coffee machines. You know, when does everyone start having espresso machines? I had Mr. Coffee, I've never had an espresso machine. I make my coffee in the morning with a cone and a drip and a pour water in it. Ugh, it's not very nice. But it makes a good cup of coffee. <clears throat> but espresso machines, if we can do the same thing with an espresso machine, and look at the whole entire cultural history behind espresso machines, how it developed, how they became common, and also to have in homes, because espresso machines were in... Well, in Italy, in what's called bars, uh, which is not where you go and necessarily you know, drink alcohol, but also just for coffee in the morning. If you're in Italy, if I don't know if any of you have been there, but you go, you, you go to the, the bar in the early morning, get a you know, little cappuccino or, or an espresso, and you go from there. It's very nice. But that shift from a, 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 a retail store commercial function of the espresso machine to an individual function for homes but yet espresso machines are more expensive <clears throat> mr coffee was relatively inexpensive but anybody with, could have mr coffee not everybody has espresso machines as i never, never did and so there's all these revelations we start studying and asking questions they can reveal about our culture and society something as again everyday banal right before our eyes coffee machines coffee makers we can do the same thing with almost any other household object we can do the same thing with um uh -oh, here we go with uh things that we own and possess 
all these things can have meaning. And that is what material culture studies and analyzes and tries to get at. The meaning of the things that we have, that we possess, that we look at, that we analyze, that affect us, whether it's in museums or in our household. And then what do they mean? Now, we can also be... Uh, you can also make more things than they actually are. You can say, okay, look at me. This is, I'm now wearing a sweater. This is not a vest. The last couple of lectures anyway, I've lectured to you with you know, a shirt and a tie and a, and a sweater vest. Now I'm wearing more of a sweater. Why? And we could ask, does that have some sort of psychological explanation? Is it um, simply a function of temperature? Is it a function of what I might have clean? Is it a function of my own sense of style? Uh, what is available? All these different questions can reveal things. Now, if you wanted to take my sweater as your artifact, I would probably tell you that's going down a dead end. It's just a thing that I have. But for me, it's part of the things that make up my world. I don't even remember where I got this. I think my wife gave it to me uh, for a birthday or Christmas a number of years ago. Um, I wear it. It's functional. It's nice. But it would not tell you a great deal about me. Maybe I'm being oblivious and blind to something and come up with something. You know, we've heard the phrase, you know, you are what you wear. The ma clothes make the man or the clothes make the woman. I just think of, um, I don't know if any of you watched the inauguration, but all the discussion about fashion and what people wore, wore Bernie Sanders mittens and all those things. Somehow what we wear is a revelation of our style, our position, how we want to present ourselves, um, and... There is meaning in all of those things, or not. And that's the big question of how do we determine what is consciously meant to make a statement and what simply makes a statement, even if it was not consciously intended. And that is, in some ways, I'm talking about thick description, um, discerning the winks from the ticks, at least I think I did. Um, if I didn't, my apologies. It must have been with another lecture. Um, but to see the meaning is not inherent in the thing, but it's what we bring to it. This is a footnote uh, with winks and ticks. It's from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. Uh, he talks about you know, the difference between an eye twitching and a wink. And if I already did this in here, my apologies. Um, but if I didn't, at least that explains that, because Geertz was an anthropologist talking about indigenous tribes in South America and trying to understand the difference in meaning between a twitch and a wink. In some ways, that's the problem the historians face with almost everything. Because if I am just twitching, that has different meaning from if I am winking. And then there are various types of winks, various meanings of winks. How do we discern what those winks mean if we can determine the difference between a wink and a tick? How can we discern what my sweater means or what Bernie's mittens mean or what um, Dr. Biden's dress meant? Um, and then good luck if you can figure out what Lady Gaga's outfit meant. Um, so all those types of, of, of issues are interpretations and discussions. And we think, okay, that's just fashion design. And, and yeah, But that is what a culture is about. And how can we really understand ourselves if we don't understand ourselves within a general culture, but also then in specific more micro cultures and then individual preference within those micro cultures. So there's a larger aspect the more narrow aspect and the most narrow aspect in, in many cases. And we can ask questions about 
artifacts on all those different levels. Now, going from Bernie Sanders' mittens to that broader le lecture or level of, of culture, you could certainly do. Because not only, why did he wear them at the inauguration? I mean, was he making a conscious statement? I mean, again, there's been articles written about it. It's been discussed on the, you know, the internet and on news and everything else. He wasn't wearing an overcoat and gloves like most of the people there. But, you know, or was he just cold? Was he like saying, I'm not going to be worried about uh, my, my appearance and such. Um, I'm going to be comfortable, so I'm going to wear my mittens. And then why those mittens? Well, it turns out that someone in his hometown or nearby you know, made them for him, and he started wearing them, actually. And so we could start asking, okay, well, what does that signify? What, does, what did those mittens signify in terms of understanding Bernie Sanders and his relationship to his constituents? Someone actually made those, so they didn't go out and buy them and give them to him. How many of you wear things that you make yourselves or that someone made for you? What is the function and the cultural relevance of knitting, crocheting, whatever they are, um, our own mittens, hats, gloves, things? You know, it used to be that humans had to make all of their clothes, and clothes still have to be made by somebody. Fashion clothing is a huge industry now. But we also then still have individuals making individual pieces, articles of clothing, mittens, gloves, hats, whatever, sweaters. And that has a different meaning than going out and buying something and wearing it. So we can look at the whole shift in American dress and fashion from, you know, a, a local artisan product to big business as well as then you know this is tied to a particular region people from Arizona uh, weren't wearing mittens you know, they, they could say well wait a minute yes they do because it, it's cold in Arizona I know I lived in Arizona for quite a while I know it can get very cold and yes I did have gloves anyway point being depending on how we ask the question and what level of circle of interpretation we can get to those mittens could act, act as a source as evidence of an historical argument just as mr coffee which is simply a coffee machine on our kitchen counter could act as a source for discussing american material culture american culture as such american advertising american gender politics and everything else so all of a sudden something that seems rather banal and daily and common can take on huge significance when seen in the proper context when questions are started to be asked about it and we go from there um, I think I mentioned previously that um, in a previous course in 217 you know, during this project one of the students um, chose as an artifact her grandfather's World War II jacket now, as an individual jacket, that's, this is my grandfather's jacket. What does that tell us about him? Well, we know he got it, so he got the jacket for being in World War II. And then talked about the history of that jacket, not so much the individual one, but the type of jacket that it was and the significance of that for military uniforms at the time. Military uniforms at the time gets at the whole concept of military culture, military discipline, the role and function of how the military presents itself, the functionality of it, and on we go. So there are entire worlds behind the objects that we have that we take for granted in our everyday life. That's starting to think as historians with sources. Rather than trying to find sources that we think will prove our position, our theory, our interpretation, our opinion, our belief, we need to start with the sources themselves. Start with the artifacts themselves and start to ask questions. Because only then can we come up with new insight into what they signify. Now, you may be saying, okay, that's the last slide. You've talked about 
most of these things already. And this is a very short lecture. And I'm not going to apologize for that. You're probably saying, Phew, good, okay, great. Not every lecture is going to be an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half or whatever some of the others have been. And I don't have a problem with that, especially in a video format. But I want, uh, what I want you to think about as you're choosing your artifact is the general topic, okay? Am I interested in fashion? Am I interested in popular culture? Am I interested in elite culture within American society or in European society or Far Eastern society and ancient society? Um, what do I find intriguing? And what are the things that exist that might tell me something about that which I'm interested in? And then start to ask more questions about it. Because the more precise questions we can ask, the more we can then know, depending if we can discern answers or reliable answers, about those questions that we ask. So as you're thinking about what artifact do I want, it can be anything from, as I said, one of the monuments downtown, um, it can be something from your, you know, a family heirloom, something that you find in a box, uh, something that you have on your shelf. Now, I hope no one will just say, okay, yeah, 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 I'm not going to worry about this. Oh my gosh, it's now February 4th. I have to come up with something. So I just grab something from my room and say, I'm going to do this. It would work. I could look around my room and you know, pick all kinds of things that are indeed things that have been made. But then you have to really analyze this thing. And so think about what you might want to be able to analyze in depth, do research on, to see what it actually reveals or can reveal about its existence. Because one of the things that we need to ask in this project as you're working on it, is what made this thing possible? How did it come to be where it is, where I found it or discovered it? And that gives us a whole other realm of questions to ask. Because all of a sudden, it's like the culture, the society produced this, the need produced this. I mean, here I'm just reaching over my desk and holding up one of these clips. Okay, I could choose this as, a, as, a, as an artifact. This is an artifact. It's a thing that's been made. You say, yeah, but there's no meaning of that. Well, there is a meaning of this. Someone devised this, discovered this, invented this as a way of holding papers together. You go, boop, 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 and there you go. It's like a super duper paper clip. How do we hold papers together? Why do we need to hold papers together? And all of a sudden, what was it made out of? Where did the materials come from? Who made this? Who devised it? How much money is involved? What's the market? What's the you know annual um, profit of companies who make these things? What do they you know sell for? How much does it cost? What you know, is the economic aspect of this? And why do I just like throw it on my desk? And it's not being used for anything. I, I use it for something sometimes, but other times not. And to me, it has no meaning except a function when I need it or want it. And yet as historians, we can say, okay, part of material culture. Why is that there? How does it work? We have different ways of preserving papers and things. We all need to keep papers and things. We used to need to keep papers and things. That's another shift in society, everything going digital. But in terms of file folders and binders and things like that, where do you store paper? When I was in Europe for the first time working, um, 
the University of Groningen. Um, it was a bit odd because the files that you would get are different. Not only the file folders, but then you, you had these um, kind of portfolio things that you put things in that were you could not buy here in the United States. And of course, the paper size is a little different in Europe. A4 rather than nine and a half by eleven or eight and a half by eleven. So there's a different size. There's a different means of storage and preserving and keeping. And those all say things about the culture. Now, no one, I'm sure, said, "Okay, I'm going to devise and discover, and invent a new paper clip so I can say something about our culture." But it does implicitly. Other times we do make things um, by intent to say something about our culture or to express our culture. Works of art are all artifacts. And so you can say, oh, can I choose a work of art? Of course you can choose a work of art for your artifact in this project. How do you deal with it? How do you treat it? How do you describe it? Those are all the issues. And you would approach it, like the painting in back, you would approach it in the same way that you would approach this. If you're choosing that painting behind me, there we go. Oh, there it is. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, you can notice, too, it's not hung on the wall. It's propped up against the wall. Or whether you choose this, the questions and approach to dealing with your artifact will be the same. I know, too, um, early on, and yes, I know, I'm belaboring the point. Um, my little clock here says we've gone 41 minutes and 40 seconds now. Um, a lot less than the earlier lectures, and that's fine. I'm not going to talk for another 40 minutes just to keep you here. Uh, but the point of all this is to help you conceptualize how to deal with your artifact or how to choose an artifact, because that is what you're going to be spending the rest of the semester working on. But I remember going to the, the new library um, downtown here, right when it opened. And not only did they have, of course, books and all these other things, but they also had uh, on display. Things on display, as most you know, libraries do, as you know, airports do. When you walk through the airport, you see you know, these displays of things. And I was shocked, because here it was a display, obviously a historical artifact placed on display of, gosh, look at that. It was a typewriter. Now, how many of you have used typewriters? Some of you may not even know really what a typewriter is. You know, I may be assuming too much. Um, but when I started, you know, well, throughout college, and then even when I started graduate school, I used a typewriter. I didn't buy a computer or get a computer until my first year in in, um, in graduate school. It was something I was afraid of. I was scared. I knew how to type, sort of. I wasn't a great typer, but I knew how to type. And I had to type papers and all those wonderful things. And the computer was like foreign and scary. And so it, took, uh, it was a real process of me transitioning from using a typewriter to using a computer. But here it was in the, in the, the new library downtown placed as this ancient thing was a typewriter. Now, I'm not talking about the old-fashioned typewriters or the black ones or the Olympia typewriters with the big you know, type going up and back and up and back. And I've used one of those, too, or something similar. I'm talking about an IBM electric typewriter. An IBM electric typewriter was placed in the library on display as an outmoded means of writing. Oh my gosh, where have we come from? How has society developed, developed and changed? It was an artifact. It was an artifact. Old computers are artifacts. Anything in a museum you find is an artifact. Something that has been made. You say, well, what about the Natural History Museum? Those aren't artifacts. Well, yes, they are artifacts because the display is made. There, things are brought there in terms of natural history that are made. 
think that doesn't mean I don't know. Do we have a? I don't even know if we have a museum of natural history um, here in Indianapolis. But if you were to go to one and say, okay, here's a, a dinosaur. Oh, well, of course, well, the Children's Museum, there are actual bones of dinosaurs. Are those things made? Well, yes and no. Could you choose you know, a Tyrannosaurus skeleton in the Children's Museum? You could, but it would also complicate your project. I don't want to discourage you from that. And why do I say that? Because it's an artifact, but it's a reconstructed artifact placed within artifacts, even though the bones themselves are natural. But it's a thing that exists. The bones themselves don't say much other than their bones. And Richard III's bones that were discovered under that parking lot in England um, are not themselves artifacts until they're started to be in, in described and interpreted. And then they're on you know, display, they're preserved, and then we're talking about that which signifies a human being. So you might say, well, now you're getting away from your definition of an artifact is anything that exists that is made. Uh, to an extent, but it's a very narrow one, uh, and if you would like to choose bones in a museum somewhere that aren't made and as such, um, we can discuss that, and I hope um, we can talk about that because it would be tricky dealing with it as such, but what those displays show is not only the thing themselves, but that someone finds it important to put them on display. So they can't, in that sense, be used because museums are things that are made by humans. So why is something in a museum, even if it's a natural object that occurred in nature, how does that function as an artifact, something for us today? And what level are we talking about? Are we talking about you know, T-Rex itself, or are we talking about the Children's Museum? Or are we talking about, you know, the historical reconstruction of dinosaurs? Why are we interested in dinosaurs? All these kinds of questions. Get at cultural meaning that helps us understand the past and also the two present. Now, I hope this has helped somewhat in terms of getting your mind wrapped around what is an artifact, what do I mean by it in terms of this course. Um, again, if you've already selected one, give you some ideas of how to approach it. Uh, if you haven't, give you an idea of what to look for and why and how. Um, and the second part of this lecture, so to speak, on artifacts, or the second lecture, which will be the first lecture of week three, um, will be on artifacts that are documents. Because there too, much like in a museum, we have uh, uh, to be careful what is the artifact and what the artifacts contains and what the artifacts signifies. Texts are a whole different issue. You can say, well, wait a minute, I've already selected an artifact. And one of you have, has approached me um, asking if uh, a campaign pen so one of those campaign pins uh, from the 1920s could work as an artifact. I said, absolutely. It would be fantastic. But there will be text on that thing. How to deal with text and thing can be very complex and even more difficult than dealing with, you know, <laughs> physical object. Because it is a physical object, but then dealing with text adds a whole nother dimension, but we'll be talking more about that in the next lecture. But think about then artifacts, your artifact or the artifact that you want to choose and select, because there are worlds of meaning that can be discovered in, again, like the towel that you, you know, squeeze out all the water. We have to squeeze out all the meaning, because it's not just a given. They force us to ask questions. Why am I here? How did I get here? What allowed me, me, this artifact, 
for being here. That's when I said that the, the sources of artifacts question us as much as we question the artifacts. And that is the foundation and the beginning of doing history and somehow, in my view, is an essential component of the nature of history and its doing. Stay tuned for Artifacts Part 2, soon to be posted. Um, and we'll go from there. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to email me. Um, and then we continue from where we are. February 5th, just as a note, uh, you need to have your artifacts well in hand to make sufficient progress on your pr project. So with that, say goodbye for now. And... Uh, See you again shortly. Bye-bye.